It's 1035 on Tuesday, April 20th. The House Criminal Justice Subcommittee is now in session. Madam Clerk, please take the roll. Representatives Beck, Curcio. Here. Farmer, Griffey, Moore. Hardaway, yeah. Howell, yeah. Lamberth, Curcio. Moody, yeah. Russell, yeah. Chairman Doggett, Present. Representative Sexton. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you, Madam. Uh, members, are there any personal orders before we begin? What is our final calendar of, of the year? Seeing none, we are going to dive right in. Item number one, House Bill 1434 by Leader Cheryl. Motion. Second. You have a motion and a second. You recognized uh, there is an amendment that you have here that uh, motion is a, it is an untimely filed amendment. So you want to withdraw that motion? We'll need a motion for consideration of this amendment coded 006569. There is a motion. Second. And a second on this amendment. Uh, you're recognized. Or, or, okay, now there will be a vote to consider the amendment. All those in favor of considering an untimely filed amendment say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes prevail. Now we'll need a motion and a second on this amendment. Motion. All right, now we're in the proper form. You're recognized, Leader Cheryl, on the amendment. Thank you, uh, Chairman and members. This is uh, House Bill uh, 1434. It does have this amendment of uh, 06569, and uh, I understand the amendment is on the bill now. And, of course, this, this bill does two things. The bill uh, first explains the notification for all victims of crimes through the Vine Notification System that is operated by the Tennessee Sheriff's Association. Victims can sign up and receive notification by email, phone calls, or text messages, and also receive support through the hotline. And these notifications tells victims when the offender is being released or transferred from the jail. Uh, the second, um, this bill clarifies that victims of crimes have the ability to decline to speak with representatives of defense counsel. This right already exists to defense counsel, but this explains the right to people that work for them. The bill also ensures that defense counsel and their representatives have to make victims aware of their right to not communicate with defendant counsel or to end an interview. Thank you very much. Uh, I have Leader Lamberth on my list. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In reviewing the late filed amendment that we've now adopted, um, there is a verbal amendment that I would make at this time to amendment coded 6569 on House Bill 1434. This is in section two, subsection A. I would move that we remove the second part of that sentence starting at the second time the word victim is mentioned. We would add a period after the second time the word victim is mentioned in that sentence and we remove the following language, and shall not be questioned at any hearing related to the criminal prosecution about the victim's refusal to do so. So we would, my, my verbal amendment would be twofold to remove that section of that sentence and add a period after the second time victim is mentioned in subsection A under section two, and under subsection B of section two, uh, at the very end, or excuse me, at uh, the first portion of subsection B, where it says, shall present a printed form to the victim clearly stating that, it would instead say, shall communicate to the victim clearly stating that. And that, I think, will match what the sponsor's intent on this is, and I would move that verbal amendment at this juncture. Okay, you have a motion. You have been seconded on that. Mr. Now we'll be voting to adopt the verbal amendment. All those in favor of adopting uh, said verbal amendment say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes prevail. We adopt. Now we're on amendment one as amended. Any, any questions for the sponsor on amendment one? Question has been called on the amendment. Any objection? Seeing none, we're now voting to add uh, amendment number 006569 as amended on the House Bill 1434. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, aye. no. The ayes prevail. Uh, question, 
question has been called. Any objections? Seeing none. We're now voting on sending House Bill 1434 on the full calendar or full uh, criminal. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And those opposed, no. The ayes prevail. You move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and members. Next item on our list is House Bill, or excuse me, House Joint Resolution 44 by Chair Lady Hazelwood. You have a motion and a second. You're recognized. Second. <clears throat> you to talk about Marcy's Law. Um, Marcy's Law in Tennessee would give crime victims meaningful and enforceable constitutional rights that they don't currently have and protections that are equal to the rights of the accused. Again, what we're trying to do with Marcy's Law is simply to balance the equation so that victims and defendants both have the same level of protections. We all know that the accused and the convicted have enforceable constitutional protections. It's important, and that shouldn't change. We're not asking for a change in that. We're just saying Tennessee crime victims and their families should be given that same level of protection. We all know that justice doesn't necessarily equal fairness, but fairness should certainly be a component of justice, and this is just simply about fairness for victims. I know you've read the amendment, and um, we have the amendment number 6603 that does make the bill. We have a number of people here to testify, uh, both pro and I'm sure some perhaps on the other side as well. But um, again, I would just uh, ask that we would attach Amendment 6603 to the bill and then we can have further discussion. You have a motion and a second on the amendment. <clears throat> um, any questions for the sponsor on the amendment? Question Question's been called. Any objections? Seeing none, we're voting to add Amendment Code 6603 on uh, HJR 44. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes prevail. You adopt. We're now in House Joint Resolution 44 as amended. Uh, sponsor, would you like for us to, would this be a convenient time to go out of session to hear? It from, would. Okay. Uh, without objection, we're going to go out of session. We're going to hear from, uh, and, and the way that we're going to do this today is I'm going to call your names up that, that I have here on the list to testify. We have seats here for you to sit at. If you would, come up as a group. Uh, members, we're going to have each individual that is here to testify will have four minutes apiece to speak. Uh, I encourage you to take notes uh, with their names and, and questions that you might have for them. After they've completed their testimony, we will have time for us to ask them questions as we go through this process. And so uh, I have here on my list, uh, Emily Buck. Are you here? All right, great. Uh, if, you, if you'll want to come up forward, you can have, you can stand at the podium, you can sit at the, one of the chairs there. And April Judkins, she's not here, okay. Uh, Leslie Montgomery, okay, you may come forward. And then a judge, uh, Maria Verdon. Okay. Okay, if you will, make sure that your microphones are turned on there, and uh, I'll ask you before your, it's your turn to speak that you will announce who you are and what organization you're with, or, uh, and then you'll have four minutes for your testimony at that time. And so, uh, you want to go first? Okay, go ahead. Doesn't sound like it's on. There you oh, go. There, there we go. go. <laughs> My name is Emily Ann Buck. I am from Knoxville, Tennessee. And I am here to speak for Marcy's Law from a victim's uh, viewpoint. And I am much further along than I was back in high school days, but part of my story is when I was 15 and 16 years old, I went through an abusive relationship. Um, emotional, mental, sexual abuse. This was, you know, a perfect relationship. I come from a really good home. My parents are still married to this day. There's nothing that tells me as the cheerleader, the class president, that you should be on that side of town because the thing is this happens in every single walk of life. 
It happens in every single culture. It doesn't matter what you look like, the culture that you live in, the color of your skin, this happens. One in three girls, one in three girls. I am a woman speaking, so I'm giving you that statistics, but yes, it does happen to men. We just don't hear about it as much. But one in three girls will experience dating and domestic violence, and the numbers are continuing to increase, especially with COVID and isolation and people being locked down. These numbers are rising. The mental health that's coming from this is a crisis. When I was 16 years old, I went through this relationship and had nobody to help me, nobody. I had the principal turn their back on me. I had this boyfriend, after a year and a half of abuse, taking me through all this different types of abuse, end up creating child pornographic pictures of my body that were passed around the school. We could not sue Kinko's, remember Kinko's? We could not sue Kinko's. The principal would not do anything. You know what he said to me? He said, there's nothing I can do because it's your word against his. He'll just tell me he doesn't have the pictures. So I walked the halls of my school alone every single day, isolated, because that's what abusers do. They isolate you and they take you away from your family and your friends so you feel like you don't have help. So what happened? Well, <laughs> I got the raw end of the deal. There were days I wasn't allowed to go to school. There were days I was taken out of school. I had to order of protection against him, but he got to live his life. I sat under a gag threat by the court, not allowing to discuss anything that happened to me. And we all know what high school's like. I don't think anybody in this room necessarily would want to go back to those days. Am I right? So if you're walking around the school and you're under a gag threat by the court and you know nobody has your back, how on earth are you supposed to move forward? Well, thank goodness I had my faith and I had my family. Because as I sat at home, away from school and away from my peers and doing the things I should have been doing as a normal teenager, I was going through what three different therapists told me a 30-year-old woman should be experiencing. So I hit rock bottom. I thought about drugs. I was suicidal twice. But yet I went through these three different therapists to help me gain that strength to move forward. The courts didn't help me. Yes, we had police involved, but they told my parents, we recommend that you don't press charges because those pictures are going to get blown up in court. So they decided to do that as a parent. I am a parent myself, so I understand the decision that they made. But I'm not here really to talk about me because I'm beyond that. That was quite a few years ago, and I have found a new strength and a new voice for those that are hurting every single day, each and every day that can't get out of this. This week alone, I did a news interview and had a woman reach out to me. She told me, I can't get away from this man. Please help me. Nobody helps me. Here, here, here. She's called all the different organizations, all the different shelters, and they just give her a new number and a new number and a new number. And she said, I saw you on the news, and I just knew you could help me. And she tells me, and this is where, I'm, this is where I want to put the emphasis. She said, I finally went on a date with him again because I thought he was going to turn and change things around. That's what we always hear as a victim, that maybe this one time things are going to change. That's the manipulation. That's the brainwashing. It takes. I'm sorry, your four minutes are up. I'm sorry. Okay. So, yes, All sir. Right. Ma'am, I'd like to know what else you wanted to share, and if you don't mind, if you could continue, Mr. Chairman, if I may ask that That'll question. That'll be fine. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Chairman. Thank Absolutely. you so much. So talking to this woman, I was telling her it takes seven to ten times for a victim to leave. It is not easy. It's so easy to sit in this chair and say, why don't you just go? Just go get help. We don't have the strength or the ability as a survivor to do this. We're literally just surviving. We're not thriving yet. I'm thriving right now or I wouldn't be standing in front of you today. But what I'm doing is representing the people who are crying out for help saying, I can't do this anymore and I have no one that is for me. And the police, that's a whole other thing. I am, I am a criminal justice major, like I am backing the blue. But they are turning away from the victims and blaming them. And so great example that she shared with me is she finally went on this date. She's a 55 year old woman. I am much younger than her and she's reaching out to help, get help from me. And she said, I went on this date. You know what he did to me? He put ghost pepper flakes inside of me. And the police said, well, you shouldn't have showed up. Yeah, it's that bad. They said, you shouldn't have showed up. But she did show up one time because she thought, you know, just maybe this guy is finally turning his life around. 
So that is just a recent story, but I've been a domestic violence speaker for over 12 years, and I could sit here all day and tell you the stories of the people who are crying out to me that need you guys to really consider this law in the state of Tennessee. Thank you. Man, thank you for your testimony today, and I promise you that is exactly what we're trying to do. And most of the time when we go through this process, it takes a long time. And so there's nothing that we're going to do today that would take away from what your goals are. And I appreciate your bravery in being here. And thank you for fighting every single day um, for other young ladies that are out there that have gone through the hell that you have experienced. And so we deeply, deeply appreciate your testimony today. It's the reason I asked the question for you to continue because I, I have for years kind of bristled at the thought when a, a police officer or a district attorney asks a victim whether or not you want to press charges. I wish we would get away from that. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to anybody. I used to be an assistant district attorney. I would always ask a victim or victim's family what their guidance was to me on how to proceed with the case. I never asked them, should I proceed with the case? That was my job. That's the state of Tennessee's job. I'm sorry they put you in that position. No victim should ever be put in that spot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, next on our list, uh, Leslie Montgomery. My name is Leslie Montgomery. Um, I am from Scotland, if you can hear my accent. Um, I always get asked that question. I am a victim of a crime. Um, it happened on May 5th, um, 2016. Um, my husband was arrested um, for solicitating my murder. Um, I still continue to wait, five, almost five years later, this May, It'll be five years um, for him to come to uh, court. Um, I've been to many, many, many court appearances. Um, I've had to sit there and listen to them. I've had not. I've not been able to put any input into the court system. I was sat. Um, they were asking for telephones, and I was sat there. And one time, they. Um, his lawyer was late, so I was um, made to sit there, basically. Um, if I wanted to hear what was going on, um, I sat there all afternoon until 1 o'clock when they finally heard him. Um, and that's from 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, he remains in jail. I have an order of protection from him. Um, he is... Uh, I divorced him. Um, I've had multiple um, therapy sessions uh, throughout the last five years and I've seen a doctor for PTSD. Um, he's one of the reasons I can be here today. Um, I'm scared to go out at night. Um, I'm scared to let my dog out to pee at night. Um, he also managed to solicitate my murder from a jail cell. Um, he was um, incarcerated in Davidson County and um, spoke to a prisoner and I get a phone call from the TBI agent to tell me he has f done it again and um, I get told to be aware of my surroundings. Um, yeah. Um, and then um, I get a call again. Oh, he's done it again. Three times he did it from the jail cell. Finally, the first time they put him in isolation, they let him out for, of isolation. He did it again. Um, I check the website frequently to make sure that he is continues to be in isolation and cannot threaten my life again. Um, two times I've sat in the courtroom and a jury's been at the door waiting to be picked, um, which I see is a total waste of money. Um, and it was a waste of my time. Um, I took vacation time from work. Um, I'm a nurse. Uh, I think I'm a, a valuable member of society. Um, I've been a nurse for over 30 years. I work in an intensive care unit um, with children. Um, why can't my rights be heard in the courtroom? Uh, why can't uh, the judge allow this to go forward five years later? 
Um, what I'm told constantly by the DEA is they do not want a mistrial. Well, wouldn't a mistrial be better than nothing at the end of the day? Um, surely there's some laws or something that can be done for that. Uh, Marcy's law will give me a voice in the courtroom. Um, it would enable me to be um, told about when he was arrested. Um, I sat, I was woken up in the middle of the night and told that the TBI agent wanted to speak to me and um, where was I? At that time, my husband and I were separated and I was uh, living with my sister-in-law uh, who actually works for the TBI. And she was saying to me, why do they want to speak to you? And my first thought was something's happened to him. But they came to the house in the middle of the night, one o'clock in the morning, and told me that he wanted to me to die. Um, he... They um, then subpoenaed me to court, um, and so that's when I find out a little bit more. But uh, that night, I didn't sleep. Um, he wasn't arrested. I was told that he was told that they were aware um, they have tapes of him, um, and that they were aware that they wanted he wanted to harm me, and that as as much as I stubbed my toe, they would uh, they would know about it. Um, it was the following day, around about five o'clock, my sister-in-law got a phone call to tell her, um, due to the fact that she works for the TBI, um, not to call me and tell me that uh, my ex-husband was arrested for my, um, for soliciting my murder. Um, I think Marcia's Law can help me, um, weave through the court system, um, have a little bit more support, um, give me a voice um, in front of a judge that just looks at me, um, obviously he knows who I am. Um, I think the hardest part for me was to go and get an order of protection. Um, my my um, my therapist, the doctor, psychologist have told me that I was gaslit. Um, I've read about that. I know a little bit more about it. Um, I don't know know that um, lawyers or the court know about it. Um, but I was living basically on eggshells the whole of my marriage. Um, he took me financially. Um, he had a private mailbox I knew nothing about. Um, things were all in his name. He tried to put my, uh, take my name off of the house we had recently bought. Um, lots of other things that basically didn't come up in divorce. And why did my divorce take five years? I should have been an instantaneous divorce. But then again, as a victim of crime and suffering from gaslighting, uh, I might not have been ready to divorce, to divorce him at that time. Um, I think victims need good therapy, um, which I think I got. Um, <coughs> now I sit and wait for a court date, um, July, June 26th is the latest one. Um, these court dates have been stopped, not because of anything the district attorney has done or I have done or anybody has done apart from my ex-husband. Um, he has fired his lawyer, he fired his public defender. Um, he's fired his lawyer four times and is now on to the fifth lawyer. Mm -hmm. Who's paying for that as well? Because I'm not paying for it. Madam, I'm sorry. We, we are well beyond our four minutes. Oh. And so I'm, I'm sure members will have questions for you. Thanks. But thank you for sharing that. We're, we're going to go now to Judge Burden. Thank you.
If you will, please state your name and you'll have four minutes for remarks. Forgive me, it's hard not to be moved after hearing that, and so I'm, I'm sure you're all moved as well. Give me a moment to compose myself. Um, my name is Maria Verdeen. I am a senior policy counsel for Marcy's Law. Before that, uh, I was a superior court judge, Maricopa County, Phoenix, Arizona, where for 20 years I served on the criminal bench, the juvenile bench, the family court bench, and um, the civil bench. Before I was appointed to the bench, I started my career as a public defender. And before I was appointed to the bench, I went on to be an assistant attorney general. So I speak to you from that perspective. And I have spent my career hearing stories like the ones you have heard. Um, and in a state where we have had meaningful and enforceable victims' rights for close to three decades. It is very hard to spend your life hearing stories like this and not be moved by them and feel like you have a calling to do something about it. The question I'm asked most often when I come to Tennessee is why do we need a, an amendment when we already have one? The short answer is because the rights that you have in Tennessee have evolved. And at the time when you enacted this legislation, this amendment, this was the state of the art, as I'm sure you have heard. But since then, enforcement mechanisms have come in to amendments to Constitution. And those are necessary in order to be sure that those rights mean something, that they have the teeth and give people the ability to be heard, to be noticed, and participate in the criminal justice system. That's the reason for the amendment. Let me talk about three areas of concern that I have been advised are holding up Marcy's Law in this state. The first is the inclusion of the juvenile court. Let me tell you that all across the country, in states that have victims' rights, juvenile courts are included. I'm not sure how you tell the parents of a girl who has been raped that just because her perpetrator is 16 or 17 years old, they don't have the right to participate in the system. The purpose of the juvenile court, which is rehabilitation, is not inconsistent with participation of victims. The two can coexist and should. I, I bring that to your attention. The second issue that I have raised, heard raised in this state is the issue of whether these rights should apply pre-indictment. I can only illustrate that to you through an example. If you are a victim who has been beaten to a pulp and told by your perpetrator, I will be back and I will finish the job, and you do not have the right to be notified that that individual has been released pre-indictment or has not been given terms of release that protect you, I submit to you that that's unconscionable and should not be the case. Victims deserve protection, particularly at the most dangerous time of their life when the perpetrator wants to finish them off so they don't have any voice to prosecute. Finally, there's an issue of funding, and I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that in Tennessee, funding is an issue like in every other state. Every state faces the challenges of having limited resources and how to allocate those resources. It's up to the legislature to do the tough job of trying to figure out what things merit those funds I will tell you that you already have a notification system in place, and it's a good notification system. I will also tell you that the prosecutors in this state do believe that they have a calling when they do their work and believe that part of their job is to connect with, with uh, victims. So if you have costs, those should be minimal and modest. I submit to you, we would never think we should not allow a defendant to enjoy the protections and the rights that they have simply because we can't figure out how to fund it. And the victims deserve the same respect. Other jurisdictions have figured it out, and I'm sure that Tennessee can figure it out as well. In closing, Chairman, let me say that it's an honor to be here during Crime Victims Week, um, and I ask you please to renew your commitment to victims in this state and allow this bill to move forward and allow the people of Tennessee to have a vote on this issue. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I want to apologize for saying your last name incorrect. It's Verdine, and I'm sorry. I Thank you, sir. I, I respond to it. It's okay. Mom is actually my most popular name. Mom. So. Okay. Well, very good. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, members, do we have any questions for our, our guests? Representative Griffey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Judge Verdine, for being here. Uh, Ms. Montgomery and Ms. Buck, all of you all, thank you for your courage, and thank you for advocating for the voice of victims. I, too, have a background as an assistant public defender, a prosecutor, uh, private defense attorney, and uh, I think uh, being a member of that criminal court, we can appreciate how we get so tied up with the defendant, we, we forget to focus on uh, there's victims on the other side of this, and they deserve respect to be treated. And um, <clears throat> I look at our responsibility as a state is to maintain public safety order, provide for our public schools, transportation, but maintaining public safety and treating victims appropriately um, that's one of the highest priorities, and uh, I think we should fully fund it. If we need a victim witness coordinator for every courtroom, I think we ought to fund that. So I appreciate you being here. Thank, Thank you, you, ladies, sir. all of you all for advocating for this this Thank cause. You, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on my list is uh, Representative Sexton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I say thank you to all the testimony that we've heard. I missed a little bit of it, but um, one of the questions that I wanted to raise or make a statement was everything that I've heard, it, everything from all sides is positive when it comes to victims. I think everyone's on the same page that need to cover the victims. The thing that the negative part that I've heard is that uh, the mechanism to put this into place, yes, the funding and, and everything else to make it work. And my question is, I don't know, uh, it, it's one thing to pass a law, it's another thing to implement that. And the implementation is where that we're going to see the results. If we can't get it implemented, then we're no better off because we've passed a law. We still haven't done anything. And I think uh, to make this work, this is not a small thing. It's a very large um, piece of legislation. It's going to cause a lot of a lot of changes. Now, every district attorney that I've talked to of mine uh, is, is for victims' rights, and, and they're not at all against this legislation. They don't know how to implement it. They don't know where the funding's going to come from. And I think that's really what we're facing. And you said we as a legislature, it's our job to do it. And I agree with you. It is our job to find that. How do you find it? And how do you, how do you put all of that together to make it work? And just personally, I don't know whether we're ready at this point to, to implement it and to bring it to pass. Um, and one of the negative things that I've heard is that from my district attorneys is that, that you all won't listen. You won't take changes. You won't, you won't work with them. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I'm just sharing that information with you that they've tried to offer some, um, you know, some, some ways of implementing it and that one of them said that and, and, and this one's a very reasonable guy. Uh, he's not a bomb thrower. But he said it was either your all's way or no way. So I don't know whether any of that is true. I haven't been in those negotiations. But I think, I think everybody's on the same page as far as Marcy's Law goes, that they want victims' rights. But how do we pull it off? How do we make this, this vehicle run? And how do we get it? To going down the tracks and um, you know my suggestion would be before that we pass a law that we don't know whether we can implement that we look at some ways to make this this work and that would just be my position on it. May I respond sir? sir? Madam you'll, when he finishes his comments you'll have an opportunity to respond. I'm sorry I, I thought you were. Well I, I, I really am but I just just want to say that um, I think that if we could come to some agreement of how that we could make it work before we pass the legislation, I think that would be a good move for us. And 
I'm through. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, you may respond. My apologies, Representative. I, he I heard a question, and it wasn't my intention to cut you off, sir. Um, so I will tell you that, again, like um, other jurisdictions, this jurisdiction is no different. And at some point, you have to say, if, if not me, who, and if not when, if not now, when? Um, I believe that uh, Representative Hazelwood could give you a long list of each and every time Marcy's Law has met with stakeholders. And I can uh, tell you that their existing language in this bill was changed at the suggestion of both prosecutors and law enforcement agencies. So there have been modifications made to the language where uh, the stakeholders came to the table and were able to look and figure out how that should be done. Um, it is not a circumstance where Tennessee is the first. Um, there are other models in other states uh, uh, that would illuminate how implementation has occurred, um, Oklahoma perhaps being the most, uh, one of the most recent. Uh, and so there is a blueprint for you. And if, 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 want, if you want it to get done, there is a mechanism for it to get done and a way to get done. So you have worked out an agreement with uh, the law enforcement agencies on an implementation. May I answer? I don't believe that there has been complete consensus, but I will tell you that there is language in the bill that reflects concerns that were brought to the table. So you have worked out the funding? I am not, may I answer? I am not privy to how that funding works and that is not within my domain, I can tell you that. I can only share with you examples of how it has worked in other states, and the hurdle is not insurmountable. So if I hear, if I hear what you're saying is that you've, you've worked on the implementation and you've worked on the funding, but it isn't there yet, and that's, that's the only issue that I'm making. I'm, I'm just trying to find a, a place here that we can meet and work this out together. Um, it's not, you, you don't have the implementation plan, you don't have the funding, and I think it would be smart for us, if we pass a law, and I see us do this a lot up here, we pass a law that makes us feel good, then it doesn't do anything. It's not implemented or it's not put into place. I think we should have victims' rights, and I think we should have more than what we have. But I think we should not pass a law that forces us to do something that we're not ready to do. I think we should be ready for it. And if I'm hearing you correctly, we, d we don't have that mechanism together yet. We don't have the funding together yet. Yes, other states have done it, but we're not other states. We're Tennessee. We have to have our own mechanism to get this moving forward. So. That's, it's not that I think anyone is against it. I, we just want to know how to do it. And as a legislator, I want to know that we're putting something out there that can be done without, you know, turning the world upside down. Um, so I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair Lady Moody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you first, the two survivors. I admire your courage and thank you for being here today and being so open and and sharing your your stories with us and my prayers are with you as you continue on this journey um, and thank you Judge Verdeen for being here with us today I, my question I have a couple of things for you uh, is it common for for states with victim rights amendments to extend those protections to the victims of juvenile crime. I, you mentioned that, but I didn't know if you could expand on that. Um, yes, most jurisdictions, if not all, that have victims' rights amendments uh, include uh, protections in the juvenile court. Um, and they have been able to balance the purpose, which is juvenile court rehabilitation of the juvenile, 
with the protection of victims and the ability to participate. So uh, that is commonly how it is done. All right, thank you. And Chairman, I have another comment, question. Um, we were hearing, as my colleague mentioned, opposition, I guess that's a strong word, disagreement, opposition from our sheriffs and police organizations. In the other states, are you aware, have they testified in opposition to this? Not as an association. I mean, that's really kind of a first for us. We've not had an association um, come out, and generally they're, the, they're our first and our strongest supporters. Um, so it's an unusual situation. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Hardaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning, ma'am. And I certainly appreciate you uh, being here. And I really want to thank the, uh, the ladies that spoke uh, previously. You know, it takes a lot of courage. Uh, you represented uh, yourself and the, uh, the community well in your presentations. You were eloquent. You were full in your, uh, your disclosure. And I thank you for that. That, that takes a lot to reveal uh, that type of trauma uh, literally to the world. So I thank you for that. I don't think there's anyone up here that's uh, presented more legislation than I have um, in terms of protecting uh, victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, et cetera. Um, so uh, my questions uh, come from uh, that place uh, in terms of my heart and my head might have some difficult questions for you. Um, I, like uh, my colleague, I'm concerned about implementation, funding, whether we create uh, issues that may uh, actually do more harm than good. Uh, any of the states that you're familiar with, have they been able to move statutory uh, amendments along while awaiting the uh, the eventual uh, amendments for the constitutional uh, changes? Um, they, there have. Um, you know, most recently Kentucky uh, did one that went in conjunction with the uh, ballot question. Um, and uh, Ohio has also moved implementing, implementation language immediately after. So they're, they're working on that. Um, but there are, there are mechanisms. Uh, each state is unique and each state is different. And if Tennessee wanted to do that, there's no reason why Tennessee couldn't do that. Right. Do you see any issues in terms of, of how we are able to, uh, to service uh, those victims who need help now? And that's all of them. Uh, as opposed to waiting a, a multi-year uh, constitutional amendment process. And that's why I, I want to see what's available to do a dual path to uh, accomplish the implementation and funding, uh, getting some type of model in place that would serve to, uh, to make sure that when the constitutional amendment, if this passes, uh, came to fruition, that there would be a working model on how it should be implemented and funded. Have, have, have those talks uh, been carried on? I've not heard those talks other than, like I said, um, you know, some companion legislation that may have gone through when ma matters were on the ballot. Um, and, and, and I gave you Kentucky as an example. Um, but you, you cannot bypass the constitutional process. You absolutely need that because you have to be sure that you have victims that have equitable access to justice the same way defendants do. And when you're not on the same par of a law, you know, there's a hierarchy in law. And so, you know, you get, 
your local laws and then your statute and ultimately the Constitution. And when your rights are not on par with those of the other in the courtroom, then you're at a disadvantage. So you can't bypass the constitutional process. You absolutely need that. You know, what you do in the meantime, you know, may be what the state decides to do. Okay. Um, and I'm about to wrap, Mr. Chairman, because um, I, I really think that a dual path, uh, some type of hybrid solution for right now, uh, where we are able to jump in, address the issues that victims have right now. And I've, I've received calls regularly. Uh, I'm known in my community as a strong advocate. Uh, so I, I want you to keep that in mind when I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. Um, and I feel for the ladies, uh, they, they'll be on my mind. I'll pray for you uh, today and uh, in the future uh, because that's something that just goes on and on and on. Um, and hopefully you'll, you'll find a way to deal with it. Uh, you'll find a way to, uh, to be able to build uh, yourself out from that experience. But um, I'm, I'll keep praying for you uh, for that. Um, my last uh, issue is how do we balance victims' rights with the rights of our juvenile uh, population, those who uh, we're charged with rehabilitating, uh, making them whole again, trying to uh, fix some broken children so they don't end up being broken men and broken women. Um, how do we balance that uh, if, unless the scales are balanced in, in the way that it's implemented, then how can we, uh, how can we do that on the fly? May I answer? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Chairman. So having, having been a juvenile public defender, and having been a prosecutor in the juvenile court and having been a juvenile judge, I can tell you that you can rehabilitate and still hold young people accountable. In fact, being held accountable is part of rehabilitation. And oftentimes, having the victim voice or perspective in the juvenile court is of great value, not only for the offender to hear how the, the offense has impacted a family, but also for uh, the judge to hear from the victim. Um, I have heard from many victims who were not seeking punitive measures, who were seeking rehabilitative measures, who wanted to be sure that I understood that this uh, individual needed services, to be sure that he or she didn't end up uh, in that revolving door that put them in the adult system. And so, you know, we make a presumption that a victim voice is going to go a certain way. A victim voice, what, Mar what Marcy's Law seeks to do, is to empower that victim to be the voice, whatever it is that they may want it to be. So what I'm telling you is from experience, it's quite possible to balance the needs of the juvenile offender with the needs of the victim. And ultimately, the victim may not hear what the victim wants to hear, or the juvenile offender may not hear what they want to hear. But they'll hear it from the judge, and they'll hear an explanation from the judge and they will know that they had the opportunity to participate fully in the process. And which states uh, do you believe have worked that out the best? Well, my own state, point? Arizona. I mean, yeah. I can tell you that's the one I'm the most familiar with, uh, where I have seen that um, happen. But victims' rights apply in every Marcy's Law. All 13 states um, that have Marcy's Law uh, have victims' rights provisions. Um, in Arizona, our victims' rights apply to all victims. So we don't limit it to categories of folks that may fall in felonies. If you're a victim, you can opt in to participate, whether you've stolen my bike or you know set my house on fire. Um, if you have taken my mother's accounts and, and managed those and wiped them out clean, you have the same rights as you know, someone who um, may have lost a child. And have you figured out how to quantify the, uh, the success 
uh, or failures of that, uh, that approach? How do we know what's working? How do you uh, represent it in terms of data uh, for the type of reform that uh, you've been able to uh, execute? I'm, I'm sure the state of Arizona has, the, the, the Supreme Court has statistics on, you know, recidivism and victim satisfaction. And not to say that we're not without fault. I mean, anytime you go to a courtroom, there's winners and there's losers, and there's some victims that are happy and some victims that are not happy. Um, some defendants are happy and some defendants are not happy. Um, and so in terms of satisfaction, just being the opportunity, just having the opportunity to be recognized as, as someone who participates in the process, whether you win or lose, at least your voice was heard. Um, and that's essential, uh, I think, in, in, in making sure that you have meaningful and enforceable rights. It doesn't mean that you're gonna win. It doesn't mean that you have a veto over what a prosecutor may wanna do, but it does mean that a judge is gonna look you in the eye and recognize you as a human being. Well, once again, I, I thank you for your answers. I'm gonna ask if you can make some of that information available to the chairman uh, so he can share it, uh, especially in terms of the data that your Supreme Court may have collected sure. uh, that would give us a, ch a chance to look at objective data and have a firm idea of how things have gone. Happy uh, to research that for you, sir, and to provide it um, through Representative Hazelwood. All right. Thank you, ma'am. And once again, uh, my appreciation to the ladies who had the courage to show up today and share their stories. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you. Chairman Curcio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for being here. And again, I want to echo what all my colleagues have said. This has uh, been very compelling testimony, and I appreciate you all coming here today. I know that's not an, an easy task, and I'm sure you would rather be in a lot of other rooms than this one. So, so thank you for being here today. I really appreciate your testimony. Um, I, like everybody on this dais, I want to try to find a way to make this work because we all, we, we come here every day, we take time out of our businesses, our family lives as citizen legislators. And, you know, not knocking any other committees in the General Assembly process, but the Criminal Justice Committee, the Civil Justice Committee, the Judiciary Committees are known as the working committees. And so we, you know, I've, everybody around this, this room spends upwards of 40 or 50 hours a week on their part-time <laughs> job uh, trying to advocate predominantly for victims in this committee. Uh, when I was the vice chairman of this committee and I worked with, with Leader Lamberth, when I first came in as a freshman, he told me, you know, if, if your bill doesn't have a giant fiscal note, you're probably not doing anything in the Criminal Justice Committee. And so um, all of us work every day to try to pass laws that will improve the public safety and the experience of victims in our state. So, um, so we all come to this kind of with with arms open, saying, "How do we? How do we make this work?" Because we're we we want to. We're right there with you in this fight, uh, day in and day out. Um, but at the same time, we're tasked with passing laws that have immediate impact, that have you know uh, a kind of a real world application. And so, when we talk about a constitutional amendment, it's it to me, it's a very grave undertaking. It's a very serious undertaking. We need to make sure that we that we go about it and, and we think through um, what, what, the, what the ramifications of, of the words that we put into the Constitution are. Um, my friend, Vice Chairman, uh, mentioned you know, money as a concern, and you guys had a, a, a back and forth on that, and it, it sounds like the, the, the financials have not been secured at this point, it, not knowing really what the implementation um, language would look like. There's no way to know what it would cost. And so, I want to just ask about a couple of other things that I feel like, again, if we can get them right, I think all of us would feel comfortable moving forward. We just want to make sure we get them right. So you talked about enforcement as well in your, in your comments. Um, as I look through this, I'm trying to balance, again, these are words that we're putting in the Constitution. It's not a bill. It's a, it's, it's a right. So the, for example, number seven, the right to full and timely restitution from the offender uh, is listed in there. If if we were to pass this and then subsequently, let's say, once it becomes enshrined in the Constitution, we are trying to pass a bill to create, say, a restitution fund or something of that nature that has a large fiscal note to it, and it gets placed behind the budget and finance, and we, we can't move forward because there's no, there's no money to move forward. How do you feel like that puts us as a position as a state where if we, if we just simply can't get something funded that would 
prevent us from being able to comply with any component of here, whether it's whether it's victims restitution or anything else, w would we be opening ourselves up to litigation, you know, from uh, from from victims uh, attorneys saying, okay, well, the state did not uphold their end of the bargain. They enshrined these rights in the Constitution, but there's no there's no enforcement here. Do, do you think that would open us up to challenge? So you're you're not talking about enforcement of rights. You're in talking about enforcement of the legislation. So from a from a from a government position, is that I want to be sure I answer the question correctly, sir. That's correct. So there is a provision here that um, grants immunity for um, the state uh, for a claim for uh, any cause of action, claim for damages against the state, any political subdivision of the state, any officer, employee, or agent of the state or any of its political subdivisions. So, I mean, I think that encompasses that, obviously you're acting in good faith and you're working towards moving the bill along. Um, to your point, sir, I would say you have to start somewhere. I mean, if you, if you, you have a long time to work it, but you have to at least begin to move the bill along. My understanding is we need it to pass at least two sessions. Y you gotta start somewhere. You know, if you delay it, you're all that more, uh, th there's all that more uh, time that you need to make up. So from my perspective, if you wanted it to get there quickly, you gotta start moving it now. It doesn't mean that you can't work or continue to work or continue to have those discussions with stakeholders. You know, what, what the bill looks like now m might not necessarily be what it looks like as you get closer to the end. Um, so there might be some fine tuning that you might need to do. But I will tell you that what you have before you now is a compilation of Tennessee law and input from folks who um, said we want this particular provision included, including law enforcement and prosecutors, sir. Th thank you, thank you for that response. Uh, so I also read that about nothing in this section shall be construed as creating a cause of action, so on and so forth. So, so I understand that, but in, in your opening remarks, you talked about how there was there was enforcement here, and so I, I guess my concern is if we're holding ourselves harmless, but we're putting this out there, are we are we really? Let's say we move forward, chapter and verse. Are we are we really doing anything, or are we telling folks who have been victimized and who are looking to us for relief? Are we telling them one thing and doing another? Okay, may I respond? Sure. So, enforcement of victims' rights is the opportunity. I, I know you know this, sir. But to raise your hand, be recognized by the court, be called on, and say, I didn't get noticed, Judge, or I want to be heard on that position. That doesn't cost money. That's an immediate response from a judge who is looking at the victim and saying, I hear what you're saying, um, Miss Victim. Unfortunately, I'm not able to deny the continuance for you know, this reason or that reason, or yes, you were denied the opportunity to be heard. I wanna hear what you have to say now, we're gonna do this again. So, you know, these are, when I talk about enforcement provisions, it means giving the victim standing in the courtroom to immediately be recognized and immediately seek remedy so that the, the matter can move on. That's what enforcement means. It me it, if you don't have the enforcement, then you have a judge saying, oops, I'm sorry, um, let's move along, um, versus having the enforcement mechanism which gives the victim standing, not as a party, mm -hmm. but just to address the rights enumerated in this section. They don't all cost money. You know, most of these are being able to look at the judge in the eye and say, I, I, I wanna be present. Uh, I opt in, I want you to consider how this crime affected me, you know, th those kind of things, and a remedy immediately so that you don't have to wait and wait and wait five years for um, there to be some kind of recourse. Thank you, sir. Um, but for the ones that do cost money, do you worry that we again may be saying one thing and doing another? Uh, no. Honestly, I'll tell you why. Because I think you'll find a way to do it. <laughs> I think that if you make this commitment to victims, you're prioritizing how you're gonna get it done. Mm -hmm. And so, um, do I worry about that? 
no, I don't worry about that because you just told me all of you are committed to this process and want to see it work. And a delay is just going to mean a longer time before the victims can see the day when they can raise their hand in court and be recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you for that. And I, you know, again, with our committee process, and you, we talked about, you know, starting somewhere and moving forward and changing it later, um, that, that's not how we do it. Uh, we, we've got to make sure this, the subcommittee, you know, does its work so that the full committee can fine tune that work so that as it moves forward, we, we can move forward with confidence so that we're creating good work product. We, 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 don't, we don't put the blindfolds on and jump off the cliff in Tennessee. We, we make sure that we move forward with a clear path and a clear plan. So whatever happens today, I, and I hope that it's, that it's received in that spirit, that we need to make sure that, that we move forward in a way that's deliberate, uh, where we, as my grandfather would say, we could see our way to the other side. Um, it, we, we, don't, we don't just jump off a cliff here in Tennessee and, and hope that we can work it out on the back end. And, and I, I say that with uh, you know, other members in the room who have very, very good pieces of legislation sitting behind the budget that are never going to get funded. We all know they're a great idea. It's just a matter of you know, do, we, do we have the ability to, to make that a priority this year or the next. Um, I, I do want to move quickly just to um, the juvenile piece. Uh, a lot of the, the, the back and forth that I've heard about juveniles, uh, to me, doesn't, doesn't hit the nail on the head for what, what my question was. So I apologize for rehashing, going back to juveniles, even though there have been other, other questions. But let, let's say that the, the juvenile, you know, is a bad, we've talked about a lot of juveniles who are tr we're trying to reform and we're trying to get their, their lives back on track. But let's say we, we've, just, we've got a bad actor and they're going to continue to be a bad actor. Um, are you at all concerned that once that juvenile turns 18, once we lose, uh, once, once that juvenile judge, that juvenile court loses that jurisdiction over that juvenile, how do, we, how do we maintain that contact without a unified court system in Tennessee? How do we, how do we make sure that that person continues to pay uh, their financial obligation to the victims that we are now enshrining in the Constitution? Um, so two points. Um, one was how, how do we continue with that to monitor that person, and the second one was about rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. um, Marcy's law is about the victim having a voice in the criminal justice process and the juvenile justice process. How you treat juveniles in this state is your prerogative, whether you transfer them to the adult system and you try them as an adults, or whether you keep them in the juvenile system and the decision is keep, to keep them in juvenile. I, I'm not privy to that in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. In my own state, we do move juveniles. There is a process by which juveniles are transferred to the adult court and they are in the adult, adult court jurisdiction. So that's not in the preview of Marcy's Law. Marcy's Law just wants to be heard during the process, whatever decision the courts or the state may decide to make. With respect to the issue of restitution, it's handled like in any other um, jurisdiction. Once the juvenile court loses jurisdiction, the juvenile court loses jurisdiction. And then if there are civil remedies, then a, someone can pursue a civil remedy if they want to. Um, but the juvenile court jurisdiction ends when the juvenile court jurisdiction ends. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, but in that case, have we not just, again, we're enshrining these rights in the Constitution. If the juvenile court loses jurisdiction, as you've said, have we not just violated that victim's constitutional rights? Because we there's no jurisdiction over that person yet. The Constitution says that the victim is entitled to these rights from the person who victimized them, which again, I completely wholeheartedly support. I think then though we have violated that victim's constitution rights. So we are either opening ourselves up for extreme liability in that case, or as you have argued, we've held ourselves harmless. And then again, we're telling victims one thing and we're doing another. So which is it? Council, in some jurisdictions, those do convert to civil judgments um, once the person is released from probation, parole, uh, or juvenile jurisdiction. So there are mechanisms, if you want them, to be there to fulfill that promise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I, I think these are all worthwhile conversations. There's a lot of hanging chads out there that we just don't seem to have the answers to, and our task again, in the subcommittee is to make sure that we refine these issues, to make sure that we move on to full committee, that, that we're, we're really ready to go on to the next step and the next step and the next. So um, I think for me, there's still some continued unanswered questions there. You have done a great, 
um, service to this committee by helping us understand some of these issues. It just sounds like we've still got a whole lot more questions yet to answer. So I, I very much appreciate your expertise. I, again, I, I don't say this lightly. I, I want to thank um, both of the, the, the other ladies that we heard from from their testimony. These, these are extremely important issues, and we fight tooth and nail every day to make sure that Tennessee is safe and that victims are heard from in Tennessee. Um, so thank you very much, and I look forward to continuing this conversation because we've got to get it right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Representative Beck. Thank you, and thank you, Your Honor, for being here, and thank the, um, as my colleagues have said, <clears throat> thank you to the uh, witnesses. That was very uh, moving. Uh, I, I think you've answered most of my questions. I'd, 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 got in line a couple of uh, speaker uh, members ago, but my, I guess, and you talked about our victims notification that we already have in Tennessee, and, the, and, and as uh, one of the previous members said, we do fight tooth and toenail for, for our, to the rights of the victims. What is, and then, um, the representative from Memphis was asking about what is not in the code right now other than elevating the right of, uh, that you were speaking of in court that could be enacted quickly that, you th that is in Marcy's law that is not in code as we stand here today. Does that make sense? I, I'll try to answer the question comment um, the best that I can. I'm not quite sure I answered it, but I'm sure you'll redirect me um, if I'm not getting it right. <laughs> um, when you enact a statute, you run the risk of saying we don't need a constitutional amendment. And a statute will never carry the weight and the respect that a constitutional protection carries. No one would ever think of putting our, you know, freedom of speech or right to bear arms or um, freedom of religion in a statute. You know, we, we wouldn't think of protecting the defendant's rights in a statute, your due process rights, you know, your right to counsel. We wouldn't say, oh, they're protected in a statute. And so, you know, when you talk about a quick fix, there isn't a quick fix. If you truly want to enshrine and elevate and hold as a value and a tenant in the state of Tennessee a victim right, you must elevate it to the Constitution. So there are no quick fixes here. Um, it, you, you just have to start the process because it's a long process. You know, we're talking a ballot, the earliest that it could be is what, 2026? So you have to start the ball rolling. Um, I, in answer to your question, sir, I don't think there are any quick fixes. Sir. Have you studied our, our code enough to tell me what is not in our code today as to what is in Marcy's law that would, other than enshrining it today? Sure. Um, may I, uh, Chairman? Um, expanding the rights to juveniles, you know, allowing uh, the victim of a juvenile crime to have access to that process and participate in that process, um, allowing the victim to be recognized and notified um, at all stages and to participate if they want to participate. Um, those are the ones that I feel uh, stand out and are the greatest uh, protection and protections, participation, and elevations for the victims in Tennessee. Sir, uh, I'm sorry. I'm used to being where you are. I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I mean no disrespect. It's just hard. It's tough, I know. Um, the victim, not I understand the juvenile part, but the victim notification, what is the difference between victim notification in Marcy's Law and victim notification that is on the books right now? Victim notification would occur at all stages of the proceeding, including when you are being released pre-indictment. Okay, so um, 
that would allow, as I indicated, the victim of a crime before it is actually charged to know that that individual was being released, moved, or, or had um, uh, uh, concerns, issues. Okay, so our, as it stands, as we stand here today, our victim notification doesn't uh, apply to all stages. Is that what I'm hearing you say? You know, I don't have it before me, and I'm not an expert in Tennessee law. I'm sure we could ask um, Representative Curcio, and he would know the answer to that question. Well, we're not allowed to do that, so <laughs> unless he wants to raise his hand and be heard. Okay, very, very, very good. I just... Uh, was was what as a as things were going around? I was wondering what we're not doing today that Marcy's law would do uh, enshrined, and, and you've answered that very well. Thank you. Thank you. Next on my list is Representative Griffey. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, Judge Bradeen for being here again. I just wanted to. Uh, go with you to logistically make this happen, Marcy's Law, do you envision it's typically going to take more victim witness coordinators to be able to inform the victims when court's going on, have them there in court, coordinate with them so they can have a voice in the courtroom? Because that's that's the major issue this, this legislation and this constitutional amendment is seeking, is it not? That's probably right, sir. Okay. Uh, you're probably going to need that. And so, you know, 10 million bucks at... Uh, $30,000 a year, that's 333 people. That would be people working in the state of Tennessee, contributing to their community, helping in the courtrooms. At 40 grand, it'd be 250 people. You know, Tennessee ran in uh, this past January 2021, we had $380 million over uh, budgeted revenue collections. 380. Um, I just saw a recent article this morning where the governor added a line item to spend $13.5 billion to help the Knoxville Sports Authority to build a baseball stadium out there. I think we can do both. Uh, we've got the funds to do it. Uh, and this, this money to help these victim witness coordinators, we have victim witness coordinators in Tennessee right now through the DA's office, but they're understaffed. I'm familiar with it. I've been there, done that. They're trying to cover too many courts. They can't cover general sessions in juveniles court like they need to. But if you had one for each court or one county, add one to each county, that would make a huge difference. We could do that. So thank you for being here. I appreciate the effort. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> thank you for that. Uh, Leader Lamberth on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge, I, I know it's a little odd for you being down there and, and not up here, but I think you've done a wonderful job, so thank you thank for your you, testimony. Sir. I'm and thank trying. you to both. You did great, but thank you for, for both ladies that testified earlier. That's why we're all here is to try to support this. I had one quite, kind of question when you were going back and forth with the chairman. You said that, that basically, and this was my impression of what you were saying, so don't let me misstate what you were trying to convey, that if this didn't go forward today, basically this is a massive step backwards and this is going to take longer. I mean, this is a six-year process to get to the ballot no matter what we do today. I mean, it's in Tennessee, that's how it works. It has to pass in two different general assemblies. We're in year one of what could be either this General Assembly or the next one. I'm not advocating for that, but I mean, literally, there are a vast number of ideas that will be on the calendar today that are just bills. They're not even constitutional amendments that will go to next year or take additional work in order to get there. But no matter, if we took the next three years or four years almost to get this language right, it's still gonna take six years to get on the ballot. So you, you seem to kind of indicate that some action we would take today would either speed up or slow down that process if you don't mind, can you clarify just what you meant by that? Because, I mean, my reading of our laws here in Tennessee, it's a six-year process no matter what we do. Uh, Representative, I defer to your expertise on Tennessee process. Um, and certainly, you know, my intention is not to explain to you how that works. I can't do that. Um, but it is my job today to impress upon you that this is urgent and that the work needs to start and that the commitment is evidenced by a vote. And, and that's my impression, okay? We can disagree on that, but I think that the ball needs to be moving. And again, I, I'm not where you sit. I'm where mm -hmm. I stand. And from my perspective and the victim's perspective, this is urgent and needs mm -hmm. immediate attention. And so, you know, from that perspective, I would hope that you would give it the um, respect that it merits. Thank you, Chairman, and I absolutely do, but I will tell you, given the time frame, that is a fact. I mean, and, and thank you for saying, I mean, you know, that, 
this, I'm, I get it in Arizona, I'm sure they have a different process, but I mean, the process here, because of the nature of the timing of where we are, I, there is ample amount of time to make sure to get this right. And, and I'm gonna bring up just one issue, and I, I don't know how we resolve this, but I, I have been in that courtroom with like the young lady testified where her case has been pending for five years. And I was called in as a, as a prosecutor from a different county because in that particular courtroom with that particular judge who thank goodness is no longer a judge in this state, that judge would not set that case for trial. Kept setting case after case after case in front of the victim that had sat there in that courtroom over and over and over who was maimed for life based on a violent crime that had happened to her. And they finally asked someone to come in from a different county, a prosecutor to come in in a pro tem status and you know, just try to shake it up. And I came in and, and I'm proud to say through a pretty good fit and used our victim's rights statute to say, judge, she deserves a trial. Give us one immediately. And that judge probably can't stand me to this day, but we got a trial and that person was convicted and they went off to prison and I advocated for that victim's rights. The language of this says, a victim may assert the rights enumerated in this section, not as a party, but in the manner further provided by the General Assembly, which protects the victim's rights to standing. I, I vehemently oppose that language. If this language goes in this constitutional amendment, every victim that's standing there in court is going to stand alone. They have no standing. I have a problem with that language. I, I don't know how to say it. I mean, I've lived it. I've been there as a district attorney advocating for that victim. This leaves them out in the cold by themselves. I know that's not your intention, but this language, in my opinion, does that, and I have an issue with it. So I guess I'm coming at this from a different angle. I don't think the language of this constitutional amendment goes far enough. So we have ample time to get this right. I would love to hear your thoughts on that, but I feel like you're saying do it today or never do it. And I'm saying let's do it and get it right and actually stand for our victims and not just do something quickly just to get something done. And I, I just don't think that's the situation we're in with a six year runway to get this on the ballot. That's just my thoughts. I would love to hear yours. So let me begin by saying that it's music to my ears that you're committed to victims' rights and that you have a firm uh, background on having done that and, and that you can understand the need for that that you disagree with some of the language or that it's gonna take time. Um, I get that too. Uh, I'm not sitting where you sat and I'm not used to creating law. I am used to applying law and enforcing law. So, so that's my perspective. What I'm seeking is a commitment, I guess, what I'm advocating is a firm commitment from this committee that you would like to see a constitutional amendment happen that creates an enforcement provision so that victims can have meaningful and enforceable rights as is suggested in Marcy Law. So you and I and all of us could debate for a long time, but really my purpose here is to bring this to you to tell you that this deserves priority in your consideration and that it is urgent. Um, it's, and and I, I can't speak for all victims, but the victims that we have heard from would like to see this happen. Uh, yes, ma'am, I can absolutely, Your Honor, guarantee you that this is a top priority for me, and I think I can speak for a majority at least of this body in saying that supporting victims' rights and standing for them and, and getting to a resolution on this um, to make sure that this language is right is something that I will absolutely support. I don't think it's there yet. I think the language, while many have worked for weeks on this, still needs work. But we absolutely have to get there. I think it is critical that we do so. Um, so I just wanted to kind of set the stage on that because of, I think the procedures may be different here than in other states. Just like the language has been different in virtually every state that's passed this, it's, and I'm, you're shaking your head yes, and I'm glad we agree on that because it needs to match the state that it's in in order to work well for the victims so that we don't just get something on paper. Because I know you guys don't want that and we don't either. We want to get it right. So thank you, Your Honor, for your testimony today. You did a phenomenal job in a very different role, I'm sure, from what you're used to. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other questions for our guests? Seek none. Thank you again for, for your time and for being here. And ladies, for your testimony today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.
Members, we have a hard stop at, at noon. And that's in six minutes. So we are going to um, call it one of our our others. We have four here. We have the District Attorney's Office, the Sheriff's Association, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, and the Chiefs of Police that wish to testify. And we'll, we'll hear the District Attorney's uh, Conference first, and then uh, we'll go from there as time permits. If you would uh, state your name for the record, you'll have uh, four minutes uh, for comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. My name is Stephen Crump. I'm the District Attorney General for the 10th Judicial District, uh, which is in Southeast Tennessee, and I also serve as a legislative chair for the Tennessee District Attorney's General Conference. Um, we appreciate very much the opportunity to speak to you on this issue. The DA's conference is also grateful for the opportunity through many meetings that we've had with the sponsors of this legislation and also with the folks from Marcy's Law to try to craft a version of this particular bill or resolution rather, that would complement Tennessee's already robust constitutional provisions protecting the rights of victims of crime, as well as a proposal that would fit with our unique court structure, criminal justice system, and resources. Despite our best efforts, however, we still remain concerned about a number of the provisions of this legislation. Tennessee's DAs and assistant DAs fight for justice and victims in the courtroom process across Tennessee every day. We have and will continue to work to improve our laws, resources, and outcomes for victims and make Tennessee a better and safer place to live. The stories you have heard are the types of examples that inform and motivate our efforts to improve our system each year. Our hearts go out to these victims and their pain. We all naturally want to do something about the situations they describe. However, the current Marcy's Law proposal would likely not have changed any of their concerns or perceptions in a material way. It seems that either these were issues not addressed by a courtroom or by a judge, or that they would not involve a victim's right as indicated and described in Marcy's Law. While we made a proposal that we believed would, we have also strived to assume and to make sure that its coverage and impact are well understood and beneficial. There are certain provisions within Marcy's Law that we greatly like. There are some that we've asked for stronger language in. But we are concerned that this version is not Tennessee specific and that does not ultimately benefit victims as it should. First, the language and absence of accompanying enabling legislation provides vagueness. It creates situations where you don't know what you're voting on and you don't know what the cost could be and you don't know what the outcome could be. And while that should never stop a robust discussion of an important issue, they are issues that you all grapple with every day. The issues of who will provide notice, how will it be provided, who will man the court systems, how many will man the court systems. I currently have four victim witness coordinators for 22 courts that we serve. It is simply impossible to do what we do with what is proposed here. Second, in addition to introducing uncertainty into the system, the primary impact of Marsh's Law would also extend current victims' rights and services from our, from our serious cases and those cases um, that end up in front of a jury and in criminal court to all cases in the system. And while we have absolutely no opposition to that and we have spoken to them about that, we simply can't do it with the current resources that we have. You all spoke somewhat about the juvenile court system. Juvenile court currently, we don't cover juvenile court the same way we do all of the other criminal courts in Tennessee. Uh, there are specific problems in that. If we do require restitution to be paid as a constitutional mandate when they opt out and they don't get restitution. There is a constitutional violation regardless of how well everybody operated within the system. We have, in, we have calculated that the workload increase would be roughly 500% or greater upon all of our offices. Lastly, we don't know what enforcement means. Does that mean that, for example, um, a sentence would be set aside? We've asked for specific directions about that and we, we don't know what that means. We, because we represent every criminal case in the system, we feel like answers to these are necessary. We continue to remain willing to work with the sponsors of this legislation and with you to try to craft, craft um, legislation that benefits all of Tennessee's victims. Indeed, today, one of our proposals you have already passed through, the proposal today that requires notification by defense counsel um, and by their investigators to victims that they don't have to speak if they want to. That's one of several bills that our conference has proposed and that you all have passed along in this session. 
We are not here saying that Marcy's Law is bad. We are here saying that there are significant concerns that have to be addressed by you, the policy and budgetary minders in Tennessee. It is your job, it is your responsibility, in fact, it is your privilege to get to tell Tennessee what the policy should be and then to develop a way to work it. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and I'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you, members. We have about uh, 30 seconds left before we have to take a recess and I'm gonna announce that later. We will continue this conversation tomorrow. So if, uh, if we can, we will, we will go back into session. We're back in the session. Members, we're gonna stay where we're at uh, in the posture we are on this bill. We are going to recess until 2 p.m. tomorrow where we will come back uh, to hear further testimony. Recess, uh, 2 p.m. tomorrow.